Hello listeners, this video is on Tension in Poetry by Alan Tate. Alan Tate was born in the year 1899 and he died in the year 1979. His full name is John Orley Alan Tate and he is professionally mentioned as Alan Tate. He was an American poet, essayist and a poet laureate from 1943 to 1944. He belongs to the literary movement called New Criticism. New Criticism was a formalist movement in the literary theory that dominated American literary criticism during the 20th century. This New Criticism, it emphasizes on close reading, close reading particularly of poetry. In New Criticism, the scholars discover how the work of poetry in literature functioned as a self-contained, self-referential aesthetic object. This term, New Criticism, was first derived from John Crow Ramson's book, The New Criticism, published in 1941. There are other scholars who involved in New Criticism. They are I.A. Richards. I.A. Richards Practical Criticism and the Meaning of Meaning contributed to New Criticism and also T.S. Eliot's Tradition and the Individual Talent and Hamlet and His Problems contributed to New Criticism. From the famous books of T.S. Eliot, Tradition and Individual Talent, Hamlet and His Problems, there are two main important notions developed from his book that is Theory of Impersonality and objective correlative. T.S. Eliot has also condemned John Milton and Dryden. He also had likeness to metaphysical poets. His ideas over theory of impersonality and objective correlative influenced the formation of the new critical canon. The important work of Alan Tate include Ode to the Confederate Dead, he is both famous for his poetry and prose. Alan Tate is referred as one of the youngest new critics. He belongs to the southern group of American critics. His main collection of essays include reactionary essays on poetry, ideas and reason in madness. In his book, The Man of Letters in the Modern World, Selected Essays, he has spoke about tension in poetry. As a new critic, he has coined the term tension to describe what he calls the common quality of good poetry. In Tension and Poetry, he talks about the combination of both extensive or denotative and intensive or connotative meanings. This essay, Tension and Poetry, is divided into three parts. The first part deals with fallacy of communication in poetry. Part 2 deals with tension in poetry and it explains its importance. Part 3 provides the final example of the significance of poetry. In part 1, Tate explains his point with some examples. In part 2, he defines tension in poetry and explains its importance in poetry with a few examples. Also in the final part, significance of tension in poetry. He provides some examples. Let us now see each part separately. Part 1. Fallacy of Communication In this part, Tate talks about mass language. He says that mass language is the medium of communication. He gives some examples for this. The first example is Miss Millet's poem, Justice Denied in Massachusetts. This poem, during its publication in the year 1927, it received much attention. In this poem, there are two migrants named Sacco and Vanzetti. The poem Justice Denied in Massachusetts was written in the year 1927. And this poem narrates the story of two Italian immigrants. These Italian immigrants, they are convicted of robbery and murder. In a short span of time, these two immigrants were executed for their crimes in Boston in 1927 and many people have believed that these two men were innocent but they just fell as a victim to the justice system because the governor refused many pleas 
concerning any opinion. Millie, the writer herself, was one of the people who had made a plea in their defence and the writer strongly felt that the men did not get a fair public hearing because they were immigrants and because they were poor and many of the advocates were women or leftists. According to Tate, that this poem did not clarify how the judicial execution of two migrants happened. Tate says that the poet did not explain the incidents properly. Tate says that the poem has mass language. It can only be understood by few. That is, the feelings can be reciprocated to the poet only by few readers. And for those readers who could not share the feelings, this poem proves to be obscure. In this state, here comes the fallacy of communication. Fallacy means it's a false belief or a wrong idea. Another example of such obscurity is found in the poem The Wine written by James Thompson. Here in this poem, this poem does not have coherent meaning. It does not suit either literal or implied meaning. If we examine the lyrics of the poem closely, it is more obscure. That is, the imagery does not add anything to the general idea of the poem. Let me show the lyric to you. It goes like this. The wine of love is music and the feast of love is song. When love sits down to banquet, love sits long sits long and rises drunken, but not with the feast and the wine. He reeleth with his own heart that great rich wine. In this poem, the language of the poem appeals to an affected, that is, affects the emotional state. It does not have any coherent literal or implied meaning. Tate also gives another example. Him to light written by Kule. Hymn to Light is a metaphysical poem. This poem lacks the quality. It is just like the poem of John Thompson, The Wine. He gives example of the poem's lyric. The violet springs little infant stands. Girt is thy purple swaddling bands. On the fair tulip thou dost dote. Thou clothest it in a gay and party coloured coat. So according to Tate, both the poem, that is Thompson's and Cooley's poem, are failures. He then says that the poem Wine is a failure in denotation and the poem Hint to Light is a failure in connotation. Let me tell you what is denotation and connotation. Denotation is the act of denoting something, that is, the primary, literal or explicit meaning of a phrase or symbol. In simple terms, when we read a paragraph, when we just read it, we can understand only its literal meaning, that is, the primary meaning of the passage. But connotation is something different from denotation. In connotation, we do close reading. When we do close reading with the same passage, we understand better things. That is, we could understand an idea expressed in each word. We also understand the main idea or the main meaning of that passage. Here we give importance to each word of the passage. For example, the building is on fire. Here the word fire, it denotes the external fire, that is the external occurrence. But when we have a sentence like this, my heart is on fire, here the word fire, it brings understanding that uh, that person is in excitement. When we observe the poem, the wine closely, we understand that the poem lacks objective content. Let's take the first line. The wine of love is music. The words music and song, in this context, it does not allow us to comprehend the terms in extension. We can make our own changes with the first two lines of the poem. That is, the wine of love is music. 
can be written as the wine of love is a song and the second line and the feast of love is song can be written as the feast of love is music so nothing changes here and thus the poem is meaningless that is there is no reference to objects that we may distinguish as music and song when we consider the poem hin to light this is the failure of connotation the poet's reference of violet swaddling bands and light does not refer to the denotative aspects at all the connotations of the words violet swaddling bands and light it is represented by a pronoun thou and when we look into the poem with a connotative meaning it gives us a group of images we can only appreciate this poem only if we forget the denotative meanings of the terms tate thus says when we group these words it should give unified meaning but if it does not give an unified meaning then the poem is absurd so he refers these two poem and calls these poem as absurd because good poetry is a unity of all the meanings from the furthest extremes of intention and extension because any reader when he or she reads the poem the poem should give unified meaning and by the experience of the reader through his or her experience culture and humanism the reader will understand the poem and if the poem lacks to provide meanings to the reader then the poem becomes under fallacy of communication so he lists all these three under fallacy of communication let us see part 2 part 2 defines the term and explains its importance that is it defines tension in poetry here with the word tension he add two prefixes one is in and ex then the word tension becomes intention and extension the word extension it refers to the extensive or logical in other words extension refers to denotative meaning in poetry on the other hand the word intention refers to the intensive or connotative meaning of poetry so tate says that a successful poem is the one that gives two meaning that is a successful poem should have intensive and extensive meaning and whenever the poem provides these two meanings then the poem has got life tate also says that meanings selected by the readers varies according to the personal interest of the reader and the selected meanings of the readers is always between the extremes of intention and extension tate then says a person who is platonist meaning a person who has close integration with the philosophy of plato and the philosophical systems will tend to stay very close to the extension end so here he gives the example of andrew marvels to his coy mistress a person with platonist mindset will decide that marvels to his coy mistress recommends immoral behavior to young men when we see the poem to his coy mistress it is a metaphysical poem and here there is a speaker who attempts to persuade his resistant lover that they should get along sexually he also tries to convince his lover by saying that if they had all the time in the world then their relationship may not have any problem here in this poem the poem has only one meaning that is convincing his lover to make love so this kind of poem only appeals to the extensive reader and a reader with an extensive mindset will have an idea of immoral behavior but when a reader approaches the text with a extensive mindset then the reader may have the thoughts of ascetism 
or spirituality. Let me repeat again. Tate says that the poem to his coy mistress has two meanings. One is sensuality and the other is aesthetism or spirituality. So a person who understands that the behavior of the lover is immoral, then he is an extensive reader. But when the reader understands that the behavior of the lover is spiritual or aesthetic, then the reader is an intensive reader. Tate then provides another example. He quotes from Dunn's love lyric, A Valediction Forbidding Morning. This is another metaphysical poem by John Dunn, which was written between 1611 or 12. John Dunn writes this poem for his wife Annie before he left on a trip to continental Europe. This is a poem of 36 lines published in the year 1633 under the collection Songs and Sonnets. This was two years after Dunn's death. The major themes of this poem are passion, separation and acceptance. The speaker of this poem shows his affection for his significant lover. And that is the central theme of the poem. Tate, he considers the lines that contains the gold conceit. Here he says that the poet compares the souls of the lovers and their unity with the uniqueness of gold. Tate says that Dunn has used spatial image, that is he has used gold to contradict it. With this gold conceit concept, Tate also gives other examples from metaphysicals, symbolists and Shakespeare in order to prove his point. Let us see the final part. Even here, he provides example for significance of tension. In this part, Tate takes a tercet from Divine Comedy, the Divine Comedy written by Dante. Tercet meaning a set or group of three lines of rhyming together or connected by rhyme with an adjacent triplet. So he takes Tercet from Infero. Infero is the epic poem written by Dante Allegri. Dante is the Italian writer. Tate sets some example from this Infero to prove his example for tension. The context goes like this, Perlo and Francesca, they were illicit lovers and Dante meets them in the second circle of hell and they both are wringling in a high wind. Here the wind is a symbol of lust and when Francesca speaks to the poet that is Dante, the wind dies down, that is the lust dies down and she tells him where she was born. So this is how the lyric goes. The town where I was born sits on the shore. With her the poor descends to be at peace together with the streams that follow him. Here the literal meaning is that she was born in a town on the seashore. Here the river Po falls along with the tributaries. Dante, he pictures the streams of the river as chasing the Po down to the sea. Po is the longest river in Italy. Here, lust is symbolized as wind. Here, Francesca has become observed by the sin of lust. That is, she becomes the sin. So, the wind of lust is an image. It is a visual as well as an auditory image. Here Dante can only hear Francesca's voice only when the hissing sound of the wind dies down. Tate considers Dante's poem has expressed both extensive and intensive meaning. So according to Tate, these three lines are the supreme example of tension in poetry. Hope this video helps. If you have query, please write it down. Thank you for listening.